I hear voices in someone's background. Not anymore. How will I know if we're live? Yes. We're live now. We're live. Yeah. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining. I'm Judy Hecker, director of IPCNY, and we've got a lively hour in store for you. We're delighted to co-host this event with Manhattan Graphic Center and our special guests, Bud Shark in Colorado and Enrique California. Enrique's work is currently part of IPCNY's online exhibition, Reprint, Five Projects. A quick overview about tonight. Enrique and Bud will both make individual presentations followed by a moderated discussion. The audience will remain on mute. And while our chat function is off for you, we encourage you to use the question and answer function found Q&A on the far right of your Zoom bar at the bottom of your screen. Send us questions throughout and we'll address as many as we can at the end. Lastly, following the program, we'll send a very short survey. We'd love to hear your feedback and the kinds of events you'd like to see from us in the future. Now on to our four participants. Sarah Kirk Hanley, Director of Manhattan Graphics Center, the nonprofit community printmaking studio, has published articles on Chagoya's prints and organized Chagoya's 2014 print survey at the gallery at Wayne State University in Detroit. She has served as curator, critic, and specialist in the field of prints for over 20 years. Master printer and publisher Bud Shark has devoted his career to collaborating with over 150 artists since the founding of Sharks with his wife, the artist Barbara Shark, in 1976. From Red Grooms to Betty Woodman to Yvonne Jacquette and Hung Lu, artists pilgrimage to Colorado because Bud supports their strong personal vision and outside of the box making. Bud discovered the magic of lithography at the University of Wisconsin and received his MA from the University of Mexico. His editions are in museum collections from MoMA, the Met, and the Whitney to the Art Institute of Chicago and the Philadelphia Museum of Art. The book, The Legend of Bud Shark and His Indelible Ink was published for his 2009 survey at the MCA Denver and his archive of over 3,000 works and related materials can be found now at the CU Art Museum at the University of Colorado Boulder, where they're developing an exhibition currently. We're so grateful that Bud's with us here tonight. Enrique Chagoya was born and raised in Mexico City, where his father encouraged his interest in art at a very young age. His early life of political awareness and action in Mexico would later surface in his mature art. At 26, Chagoya moved to Berkeley later attending the San Francisco Art Institute and the University of California, Berkeley. He settled in San Francisco in 1995 and has been exhibiting work nationally and internationally at renowned museums ever since. He's a full professor at Stanford University's Department of Art and Art History. He's a brilliant artist, writer, and lecturer, and I'm so pleased to hand over the Zoom mic to Enrique Chagoya now. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, everybody, um, and and thank you, uh, thank you, Judy, and uh, thank thank you, Sarah and Bud, um, for uh, being together here. Uh, it's my my privilege to be part of this and to be part of the exhibition at the International Print Center in New York with some of my favorite artists. Uh, anyway, so. Um, I guess I'm going to start uh, with my talk because we have limited time. I have quite a few uh, images that I want to share. And it's better to talk with images than, with, uh, than without. So, so let me start here. I have my slideshow ready. And all right, so everybody can see it well. Can you hear me? All right, very good. So, so I'm going to start um, uh, with all kinds of prints, with uh, especially with appropriations. Uh, for a long time, I have had uh, a fascination with um, with printmaking, and particularly with reproducing, uh, uh, you know, look-alike uh, 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 prints. 
basically influenced by my childhood uh, when I was exposed to uh, my father's office. Uh, uh, my father used to work for the Central Bank in Mexico City. <laughs> And his office was um, a museum of crime. He had a lot of plates with uh, money plates that you know were next to the to the forgeries. And I was about ten years old when I was struck by by the similitude between the forgery and the actual money. There was mo the nominations from many countries, not only Mexican uh, a, a fake money, but also American U.S. dollars. Uh, francs, uh, Moroccan money, uh, Cuban pesos, uh, you know, Bolivars from Venezuela, uh, and so on. So that left a big impression in me. So when I went to study uh, printmaking at the San Francisco Art Institute, for the first time I was exposed to original prints by Goya uh, in my history of printmaking class. The history of printmaking class was at the, at the, at the California I'm sorry, at the uh, Legion of Honor Museum at the Akenbach Collection. And the, the, my teacher was the, the curator there, uh, Robert Flynn Johnson. And he was uh, showing us uh, prints from different times and places in the world. And we saw them without any framing, without any glass. And I fell in love with, with uh, Goya's etchings, particularly from the disasters of war. So for our final project in the class, I, I was uh, still a, a, a student at the Art Institute in, the, in my senior year. I decided to make for my final project in the art history of printmaking, um, my first attempt to forgery. So, so, that's when I, uh, so that's when I did, I, I'm sorry, when, in my first attempt uh, against the common good. That's the, the title of the print. And uh, it, Basically, it, this was something that is about the same size as the original print. I went with my, my uh, measuring tape to see the original. I took notes in terms of how, how long should I leave it in the acid, etc. And then I draw by hand as much as I could and as close as possible the image towards uh, Goya's print. I noticed that my line was too, were too straight and in order to really make the lines close to the Goya print, I had to shake my hand a little bit. So, so the lines became more close to Goya's uh, lines. I realized then that probably by the time Goya, has, uh, Goya made these prints, he might have had a, a shaky hand. So it was kind of like a, a conversation with the ghost of Goya. Anyway, so I did uh, this uh, print in 1983. And 20 years later, uh, Segura Publishing uh, uh, in Arizona at the time, uh, printed uh, my whole series of uh, uh, after the disasters of war, my, my homage to Goya uh, in 2003. Uh, so, so I did uh, different, different prints that way. And uh, let me see if I could um, move to the next slide here. Uh, all right, so, so I began to, to do research on different um, uh, different sources, like in this case, uh, Walt Disney design of a uh, gas mask for children, which uh, today, you know, could be very useful, especially for places like uh, Disney World that they should use this probably before they close the, the the parks, but they might need them in the in the in the near future. So anyway, I decided to to mix this with uh, the other prints by Goya. By the way, these prints I, I got them from uh, the Dover edition of the Disasters of War, which, which are fairly close to the original prints. And uh, so, um, so here I decided to mix the, the, the Mickey Mouse gas mask and also the idea that when you get into Disney World, it says, welcome to the happiest place on earth, mix it with the unhappiest uh, place on earth, which is uh, war. So I end up uh, doing my own my own version of that. It's sort of like a, my yin and yang. Um, all of these etchings were done pretty much like uh, uh, tr trying to follow as much as possible the original. They are not photo etchings. They, they are uh, I basically outlined the, the image from the from a photocopy from the from the Dover book and then the rest of the lines and the Mickey Mouse I, I just uh, did a hand draw on directly on the plate. That's pretty much how I done most of my prints after Goya. I have done uh, other series, uh, uh, including uh, 
the proverbios and, and, and in this case, like on Facebook, but and, 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 and this, uh, I don't know. Facebook. <laughs> and, it's on Facebook. I, I think. <laughs> All right. Can you hear me again? Because we got to mix with the MGC stuff, uh, Mike. Uh, anyway, so um, so here um, uh, there's another series of uh, by Goya that are some of my favorite prints from the Caprichos, and uh, you know Goya made this uh, basically to to critique uh, superstition in Spain, and I did uh, a, a series of these prints. I, the, the, this is the second series of prints I did. The first one I did was, uh, again, as I say, with Segura Publishing with uh, Joe Segura in Arizona. These ones I made them at, at ULIE uh, with Bill Goldston um, a, a few years later. This was from 2012 to 2015. I did a couple of series uh, over there. Anyway, so I decided that, you know, the Goya's hat was too big for me. I, I don't pretend to, to, to compete with the, with the master, but, uh, but still I wanted to, to keep playing the idea of uh, trying to make a forgery, you know, like what I got inspired by when I was a kid in my father's office, without being a forgery, of course, and getting away with it. Uh, so I did uh, several prints too uh, from these areas, and one of my favorite prints from anywhere in all times is the sleep of reason produces monsters. In this case, Goya has sort of like a self-portrait surrounded by, by symbols of, of evil in the time. But for me, you know, the owl and, and even the bats and the cats are, are not symbols of evil. For me, in spite of the bad, uh, recent bad rap, I think it's, a, it, it, I mean, it's very beneficial for agriculture. A lot of bats are endangered species in the US. They are dying from, from, from uh, you know, fungus infections. And, and the owl is an endangered species too. So, so and, and cats, I have cats and I love cats. So I decided to, to change that for actually scary things, you know, like military equipment. So, so I have done a few, few different versions of this. Um, the, uh, this was, was done with Joe Segura as well in, in Arizona back in 1999. And this one was done at United, I mean, in, in ULIE. And they added uh, my cat Lulu on the bottom with a little bit of uh, bad wings. So I left a couple of owls here uh, as pet companions of uh, Goya. And this is more like a, like a, like, like a, like an image of an apocalyptic scene that, uh, that itself is in everybody's minds. And I decided to add uh, a Mayan skull on the bottom, yeah, but I'm gonna talk a little bit of, uh, about uh, this Mayan mythology in an upcoming uh, three-dimensional multiple that I did later. Anyway, so so I, I'm very happy we did uh, all these series. Uh, uh, this is uh, a racial stereotypes, uh, getting rid of uh, the, the racist characters here. These are like KKK chicken, uh, featherless, getting kicked out of the door. Um, by a stereotype of a, a Mexican and an African American, and uh, I have done uh, other prints. In this case, uh, this is um, a, a print that uh, we we did uh, from ULIE as a benefit for the International Print Center in New York, and I believe this is still available. And uh, this one, in this case, we see President Obama surrounded by all these evil characters. It could be people from Goldman Sachs or Tea Party, you name it. Uh, it could be anything. There was a big backlash, I, I felt, during Obama's times, uh, particularly with the uh, white supremacist group. So I decided to put a, a little KKK chicken uh, right on the bottom. It, it, this, uh, this is a leather press stamp on top of the, the etching plate. This was done in 2010. So I have done other, other images, like in this case, uh, I was invited by the Rosenbach uh, Library and Museum in Philadelphia to participate during the 2010 Philographica to make a project with them. So I went to research their print collection and I fell in love with a lot of prints by George Krushak, a British satirist from the 1700s. 
And uh, this was my, my favorite prints from those. And I decided to, to make my own version. So, so I did it, another uh, lookalike. This was uh, 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 done with a collaboration with different, different parties. The, the digital files, the etching plate, a copper plate, uh, was done in Oakland at Magnolia Editions in collaboration with Don Farnsworth. And uh, what, we, what he did, he got the, the original uh, file uh, from, from the Rosenbach uh, got, uh, library and he got rid of all the color, made it all black and white. And then I went back and did uh, the hand color on top of it uh, on a clear piece of paper. And then uh, Don made a, a file of the hand coloring I did. And then he printed the copper plate. And then on top of the, the printed uh, black and white print, he printed on a flat uh, digital printer, he printed all the color. So it looks like watercolor. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, the edition was going to be done in Philadelphia. And in Philadelphia, they could not replicate the process that we did in Oakland. So in Philadelphia, uh, the, the, the Rosenbach uh, Gallery uh, com commissioned the printing to a local artist to Cindy Ettinger, Ettinger, Ettinger from the Ettinger Studios. And, and she didn't have access to a flat printer, so she couldn't do the color. So she ended up doing a chincole in collaboration with Reed de Coit uh, from the fine, fine art, uh, uh, Silicon Gallery Fine Art Prints uh, in Philadelphia. And finally, it was done. But it, it was a lot of <laughs> work for a single print, but I'm very happy it turned out uh, very nicely. And by the way, Don did later uh, just digital print, not copper plate, uh, uh, enlarged. And he found a way in which the etching lines uh, feel three-dimensional, as if you were touching an actual engraving, but it's a digital print altogether. So that, that's, uh, that was quite, quite amazing. Anyway, so right at Magnolia, we have done other prints, uh, like this one, the, the $1 billion bill. Uh, that, that was another kind of uh, idea of a forgery without being a forgery. Uh, working on money had inspired uh, us to do quite a few uh, projects. And this one, is, this one is called the Federal Economic Privilege. No, we changed all the writing. This is the Unequal States of America. And then you could see the, the, the size, uh, the, how many billionaires uh, per, per uh, capita are in the United States, 540. There might be a few more today. This, this was done a few years ago, and the percentage per capita. We put our signatures in the middle of the, of the, the paper, and uh, George Washington as a Wall Street, Wall Street magnet. So um, let me uh, keep going moving. Um, so this is the back of the, this, the same bill. So um, it, Earlier, we did a digital dollar, like this one, that give us the actual number of the public debt. It's a computer that is connected to a satellite and has an instant, an instant update. I think, right, I mean, this was done in 2011, and it was updated about last year, in $22 trillion. Today, I, I, I don't even want to see it, but it's probably uh, at least $30 trillion. It's an unimaginable amount of work. And then on the upper right corner, you can see the share of the debt per person. Uh, this one, we call it Federal Bailout Note, the United States of America and Bond Recession. Anyway, so uh, I have done quite a quite a few different works based on the economy, uh, but I did the uh, other piece with another local publisher in, in San Francisco, Electric Works with Noah Lang. And we did this one after the last uh, economic uh, downturn in 2008. And this was done in 2009, I believe. Or two, uh, so, but I, I can't believe this, uh, this became uh, very much relevant today, uh, 10 years later. Uh, or, or 12 years later, sorry. Um, earlier we did another one, like this one. Uh, uh, the, this uh, my appropriation of Andy Warhol. This, this was done in the year 2000, about 20 years ago. 
And all of these uh, uh, cans have recipes for all these characters from the art world. And I'm sorry if I left anybody out, but I include artists, curators, historians, etc. And these are kind of like the recipes that you might be able to read in the back of the of the cans. Every every recipe is different. Um, anyway, so I'm going to move on to my codices too and my interaction with pre-Columbian imagery. Uh, I study a little bit of anthropology and the history of the conquest of Mexico, and uh, it, it, I was struck by the, the not, not only the genocide but by the cultural by the cultural uh, uh, culture side that took place during the, the conquest. Here we see uh, a picture done by an anonymous Aztec indigenous artist uh, in which the, the Spanish uh, Franciscan priests and soldiers are executing uh, eight, uh, eight indigenous leaders who refused to become Christianized. Uh, but you know th this was not only the the, the terrible uh, consequences of the conquest, but also the burning of books. Here you could see another, uh, probably the same artist, another uh, drawing by the same anonymous artist, with uh, the Franciscan priest burning the codices. You could see that in the lower right, a little character with sort of like an accordion. Those are, those are representing the books. And and the 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 Franciscan uh, priests were thinking they were burning all these uh, you know demons and pagan words of uh, of the time. Unfortunately, the biggest library in the continent, the library of Texcoco, was burned with thousands of books. And the point is that there is not even a single Aztec book that survived the conquest. Uh, there are uh, three Mayan books uh, that made it, books like this one. This is the Codex uh, Madrid. This is a, a really beautiful facsi facsimile that I found in the, in, in the Museum of El Prado. Uh, it, it's uh, very close to the original print of uh, the, the Codex Madrid. So it's one of the three Mayan books that survive in Europe and there is potentially a fourth a Mayan book in Mexico City, fragments of a book, the Codex here, but there is the Codex uh, Paris and the Codex Dresden, those are the other uh, Mayan, Mayan books that survive. A single priest, uh, Diego de Landa, was responsible for burning all of the Mayan books uh, in Central America. So it's, it's very tragic to see that the only few books survive. Well, from this perspective, I realized that uh, history is uh, written by the victors of war. And from that perspective, history is an ideological construction more than a science. So as an artist, I felt I have, I, I felt entitled to do my own versions of, of, of uh, my own books, uh, basically trying to do look-alike uh, codices. So this was uh, in the first Codex I did. This is a print. This is a, a Xerox transfer a book. It's called Tales of the Conquest. And it, this one is in the collection of the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. And, and every single image here, except for the first page, I hand painted that, but the rest is Xerox transfer. It was done with a very dangerous chemical with a paint, a, a lacquer thinner, I'm sorry. So it was pretty, I had to wear a mask to, to, to make uh, the printing of all of these. And this is a technique that I keep using until today. I have done other books based on that uh, mix of uh, comic book characters as you know, colonials, colonialist uh, symbols and characters like from Posada and and, and different mix uh, imageries that, that create their own distinctive languages in, in books like this one. This was done by Moving Part Press. Uh, the, the, the text was designed by Felicia Rice, the, the person who runs that. And the text was borrowed from performances by Guillermo Gomez Peña. And I did all the collages. Sometimes I included some of my drawings, like the, the skeleton uh, with Mickey Mouse uh, uh, hat and so on. These are some of the close-ups. Uh, there's a constant uh, collision between the, the West and the non-Western uh, indigenous cultures going on 
uh, through the pages of this book. And this book uh, was an edition of 50, uh, and I hand color about six uh, copies of them. Uh, other letterpress books I did, I did this one more recently, a couple of years ago at Arion Press in San Francisco. And the, the master printer for this one was uh, uh, Blake, it was uh, Blake Riley, who did an amazing job uh, with the leather press, especially because I, I did this design to print on, on very transparent Japanese paper on both sides. The book is Pedro Paramo by, by the, the, the title you could see it by Juan Rufo. And it's about ghosts. It's a ghost town where you don't know who's alive and who's not. And, and to me, there's a big connection with pre-Columbian concept of life and death. In the pre-Columbian concept of life and death, life is a dream. And when you die, you wake up. So anyway, so this is the, the other side of the same page. And you can see the, 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 the image of the, the, this lady becomes more like a ghost afterwards. This one uh, is also the front. Um, it, and these are not necessarily illustrations for the novel. It's more like a collaboration because the novel doesn't need illustrations. But anyways, this is the back of the other page with a volcano. Uh, then the, this uh, another uh, father and son. These are based on some portraiture by Hermenegildo Bustos, a Mexican uh, uh, self-taught painter. So I did a little bit of tribute to, of that. We keep painting people from around the same period of time as the novel that was written by Juan Rulfo. And this is the other side with a pre-Columbian uh, map with footprints and water. Anyway, so I've done uh, other books. This one, um, I was invited by the publisher of my prints in, in Palo Alto, Pola Kirkeby, to do a collaboration or, or a work on on school books uh, in Israel for, for children, for elementary schools. So I decided to do a series of monoprints from lithographic, from lithographic uh, transfers. This one is based on, on a, a censor book uh, from colonial times in Mexico, The Portentous Life of Death. And I did a collage between that and the Codex Dresden. The, the Codex Dresden is one of the three Mayan uh, uh, codices that survived that is in Germany. So here, for instance, on the left, you see the, the birth of death, which is with Adam and Eve, and, and so on. So the book was censored because according to the, 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 um, the, the Holy Inquisition, death cannot be alive. And it, it, it was not correct to say that. Plus also there had been censorship in, 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 New Mex in the New Spain, uh, in, in colonial times, since uh, the early 1500s, in 1531, all novels, uh, books of you know fiction were forbidden because the 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 viceroy in in Mexico said that the new Christians, this is quote unquote, new Christians couldn't tell the difference between fiction and nonfiction. So anyway, uh, I have a Aztec sculpture here in front of. Uh, Little Lulu speaking in Spanish. She's asking, will something important is happening now? And so on. I really love this book. Uh, most of the edition was destroyed. I believe there is a copy of the Portentous Life of Dead in the public library in New York City. So anyway, so I, I really love it. Uh, these uh, engravings where uh, the book was done by a Fray Joaquin Bolaños. It's a pretty boring book uh, in terms of of the content, but the 17 engravings were, were done by this artist, Francisco Aguilera Bustamante, who is a predecessor of Francisco Goya. This was done in the late 1700s, in, in 1792, as I believe. Anyway, so uh, talking about the Mayan uh, mythology, I, I made this uh, a sculpture. It was an edition of uh, 10, I believe. And also this was in collaboration with Noah Lang at Electric Works. And this was about the end of the world in the Mayan mythology, which was supposed to happen in 2012. I think they, they missed the, the date for a few years. <laughs> the weirdest thing to me is to see this, this work today and realize that I actually put a bat as the main character of the, the, the whole of a piece. This one is called Superbato Saves the World. And it's from, uh, I believe from 2011. 
a year before the, the, the supposed uh, end, of, uh, end of the world in the Mayan calendar. By the way, the end of the world in the Mayan calendar doesn't mean necessarily the end of the world, but the end of, of an era and the beginning of another era. So it's not totally a total destruction of the world. And the symbolism of the bats, the, the bat in the Mayan culture uh, means the guardian of the underworld. And it could be a good or a bad god. Uh, so there's a thin line, but they respected the bat as a powerful god. And to me, this is, today it gives me uh, uh, like, like an idea that we, we are getting a message from nature um, to try to have a better balance between nature and ourselves. Be, be, because so many viruses are, have come from animals, from uh, not only the bat or, or monkeys, but also other viruses have come from the Amazons, like the, the Zika virus uh, not long ago that apparently came out of the deforestation of the Amazon. So to me, this is more like at the end about gambling with our own uh, future. And, but hopefully, if we listen to the messages sometimes sent by a bat, hopefully we still have a chance to survive. Uh, this is a close up of, of the, the piece. I have used that uh, art jargon in different books, including some books I did with Bad Shark. Anyway, so I'm gonna move on. Um, uh, uh, to this uh, book, The Misadventures of the Romantic Cannibals, that uh, gave me quite a bit of trouble. This was part of uh, Bud Shark's uh, 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 celebration of the Indelible uh, Inc. that was open at the Denver Contemporary Museum of Denver, or the Museum of Contemporary in Denver, and th there was no problem there. That was in 2009. A year later, the same book uh, traveled to Loveland in Colorado. And at the time, the, in 2010, there was a year of elections and the Tea Party was very active. And they discovered my book in this exhibition of Bud at the Loveland Museum. And this uh, particular page here is what uh, gave almost a heart attack to a lot of uh, very extremist uh, religious uh, people. And uh, if, if, if the, the thing, sorry, um, Anyway, so I'm gonna have to move a little faster because we're running out of time. Anyway, so uh, unfortunately, uh, this uh, uh, page was picked by a group of people that uh, boycotted the, the exhibition, but even though the exhibition was, had nothing political, people got really upset. Somebody moved all the way, or, or drove all the way from Montana to Colorado and destroyed the print. Uh, uh, she came through, she came, she, she dropped her 18 wheeler, got into the gallery, broke the glass of the, the, the frame and destroyed the book. And I guess, I'm sorry, nobody told this person, this, this was a multiple original. It was, there are many, there were uh, at least uh, 39 other copies. Uh, the edition is 30 plus 10. And, um, Anyways, the whole thing ended up, uh, thankfully, uh, because there was another uh, a, a, another boycott by the same group at the Smithsonian Museum just about a few weeks later, and they forgot about us. The Smithsonian had the exhibition Hide and Seek, uh, which was uh, a, a lot of um, uh, queer artists, and they, they were boycotting that. So when they forgot about us, I made friends with a, pre, a pastor that, that defended my work, a pastor uh, uh, decided that he agreed with my, my, my topic on the book. The book was uh, protesting the pedophilia in the Catholic Church. And uh, he also risked his life. He, he got attacked online. He had to get a security uh, person to protect him. His house was put online. It, was, it got really scary. I got a lot of hate mail. But when they forgot about us, we became very good friends. And Pastor Jonathan Wiggins asked me if I could do a painting of Jesus for his church. And I am not religious. I told him, I am not religious. And nobody knows how Jesus looks like. So I sent him this picture. And I, th I thought, you know, they're not going to go for it. But they did. So he read or emailed to his congregation. And they accepted. And then I had to do a painting of Jesus for his congregation, which I did. So I did this piece. Um, they they loved it. Uh, it was shipped. They paid for the shipment. 
eventually they invited me to go to the, the inauguration of this uh, book. I, I didn't want to go. I was really afraid. I thought that we're going to get killed if I go because, you know, Colorado has like a itchy finger for, for, for guns. But no, I went and it was one of the most beautiful experiences I had. Nobody tried to convert me into Christianity. Nobody talked to me about Jesus. The pastor just wanted to meet me. I thank the congregation for, for being open-minded and they agreed with the pedophilia in the church should, should, should end. A few years later, I did a few more pieces after the pedophilia uh, in the church, which I think hasn't been resolved yet. And this time, just to make clear that I was not talking about anything else, but the institution of the church and not the beliefs of people, I, I was a little more, more clear. Anyway, so I'm gonna uh, uh, pretty much end up uh, my, my conversation with just showing so other stereotypes that I, I have played with, like myself in this case. I thought I was uh, putting myself in the middle of a stereotype just to show that there is a human being behind the stereotypes. But besides that, I, I researched my DNA. This is another print I did. Those, those were prints I did with Bud Sharp, by the way. I did this print at Magnolia Edition. It's a, 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 a digital print on metal. But anyway, so a few years, I mean, a few months later, I did the first print with Bud. I checked my DNA, and I happened to be 51% uh, Native American, 30% um, Southern Iberian. And the rest, I am uh, Jewish, uh, Ashkenazi, I am uh, Arabic too, I am from Central Africa, from uh, Southern Asia, from Eastern Asia. So my ancestors were very prolific um, and, and, and were, I guess, happy to mix with everybody everywhere. So the first Chagoya was born 250,000 years ago. <laughs> Anyway, so uh, some of my little paintings where I you know, blew up the stereotypes had become inspiration for some of my latest prints with Bud Sharp, like uh, this one is called Aliens, and other prints like this one. This is how Theodore de Brie represented Brazilian women. End up in this print is called The President's Xenophobic Nightmare in a Foreign Language. In Russian, you could read, I want to wake up at, in this moment. And on top in Spanish, I translate the women uh, keep the tribe. Uh, and I put every single st racial stereotype as the babies of the women. Um, so I'm going to finish my, my lecture with this uh, a, a last print I did based on Charles Weimar. Charles Weimar was a, a German immigrant, Carl Weimar, he changed his name later. The abduction of Daniel Boone's daughter by the Indians in, in 1853. That was the, the name he gave originally. I did a charcoal drawing first, uh, uh, just to show that uh, the first undocumented immigrants were the Europeans, like the Spaniard conquistadors, the pilgrims, and so on. Uh, and I ended up uh, with my most recent collaboration with, with uh, Bad Shark. And I guess I will finish my, my lecture here and we'll stop uh, sharing uh, my talk because we, we are going to move to other topics. But you're welcome to ask me other, any, any questions after this. Um, thank you for, for listening. And I'm sorry I, I went over time a little bit. All right. So I'm done. That's going to switch over to Bud. Uh, thank you so much, Enrique. All right, thank you. Sorry for over spend, spend, spend Not at time. all. It was a phenomenal um, overview uh, all right, thank of your you. work and all the different mediums uh, and introduce some of the work that you've done with Bud. So when Bud's ready, um, he will be starting a PowerPoint with really exciting images um, of his studio and of uh, Enrique working and collaborating with Bud in the studio. And here comes the PowerPoint. Hi, uh, it's a pleasure to be here and always great to hear Enrique talk about his work. And I've uh, worked with Enrique for uh, 22 years and in that 22 years we've done 26 uh, different lithographic uh, projects. Uh, this is the first print that we made 
together and um, Enrique was a visiting artist at the, at the CU uh, art department and uh, I had become aware of his work and through some other artists who knew him uh, found out that he was coming to Boulder to for the visiting artist and I asked if he would be interested in making print while he was in Colorado and um, this is the print that he made it's printed on uh, Thai mulberry paper it's a lithograph with uh, woodcut and some engraving uh, this is a close up you can see uh, in this image uh, some of the wood grain and in in the fine line drawings that are in this image are were done as an engraving on a, a litho plate which is rather unusual and but uh, worked very well for this this was printed on the back side you can see the red on this image uh, was printed on the back side, and uh, Enrique had been doing a lot of work on uh, mate paper and painting on both sides, and that's we decided to do this print um, with a semi-transparent paper to, to uh, see the image. Uh, this is Enrique working in our studio uh, for one of the uh, codexes that we were doing. After making that print, I'd been aware of some of Enrique's uh, uh, codexes that are made on a mate paper and uh, wanted to try and duplicate some of that work. And uh, Enrique said, oh, I don't think you can print on the mate paper. But uh, I usually don't uh, I usually th try to uh, do things that other people don't think is, are going to be possible. So we, um, we uh, it imported uh, the Amate paper and uh, found out that we could print it print on the Amate paper, it it's, uh, has to be calendared and run through the press about six times to flatten the paper out so that we can print it on, a, on lithographic plates. And uh, this is a, a print called the Ghosts of, Ghosts of Liberty, the Ghosts of Liberty. And this is a, a proof of the of the print uh, on the Amate and uh, after we printed all the other colors, we printed a, a light color over it to make it look a little, little more aged. This is how the print looks when it's assembled and it can be folded up as a book, but also displayed in a a shadow box frame. This is Enrique working in our studio uh, on another project. It's nice to see him at work in the studio. He, he often came with uh, a, a suitcase full of books and images and magazines and uh, selected images from that suitcase full of goodies and uh, made the print. This is, this is a mylar from the print I showed you, uh, which has been painted with a, a Xerox toner mixture and painted on the mylar, which is then laid on an aluminum plate and exposed. This particular plate was white, which we printed down first. So we would have white on the paper. The Amate paper is, is uh, brown and varied 
This is an, another mylar from, from the Ghost of Liberty. And this would be the yellow plate. This is a, another mylar. You can see uh, uh, the variations in the, the way the toner can be used on the plate. And uh, also there's splatters and deliberate uh, sort of aging of the paper. This, this is the red plate in this up, up in the left corner, you can see there's an ellipse and uh, the, the mylars are canceled after we've made the plates and uh, to sh show that the, we won't make any further addition prints of this image. This is a, another mylar with a lot of washes on it to give tonality and make, make the book look aged. This is the key plate, which is made by uh, Xeroxes that were then uh, uh, collaged on to the mylar and transferred to a, a lithographic plate, which was printed in black. This is the, the image, uh, a little larger and a, a little easier to see some of the imagery in, in the parts. Uh, on the left panel in this, there, there's also Shinkale, where we wanted a, a purer layer of, of surface that, that wasn't always a mate, and we, we did collage with uh, Thai mulberry paper. This is the, the codex books that we do with Enrique read what we would consider backwards. They read from right to left, which I, comes from the Mayan writings. This is Enrique working on a plate for one of the prints that we've done, and he's using a, a, some deletion fluid to remove some of the imagery off the plate where it wasn't wanted. This is a, a large uh, lithograph, it's 40 inches wide. And this was done in 2007 and en Enrique had a very bad bicycle accident at Stanford and uh, had a concussion. And this is, image is him on a, on a plinth and uh, the red and white squares are his concussion. There's this uh, little cartoon-like uh, piece in, uh, that runs along the bottom. This piece is called the Illegal Aliens Guide to Critical Theory. And these uh, speaker bal balloons uh, are, are, are came from book that we've found and have used a lot called Art Criticism 101 and are really rather unreadable. In this one, it says works to suggest that act, that act finally distills into something dense and unknowable. And then this is Enrique on his bike and Batman and Robin are coming to his rescue. went through the hoop and here's his bike and his crash and carried away to the hospital. Um, here he is with the, uh, riding away on his bicycle. Uh, this is Enrique and I in the studio signing, uh, signing the prints that have been completed. And this is uh, Enrique's nice uh, image to me. Um, 
we uh, wanted to talk about the Sharkive. The, the CU Art Museum has acquired our archive, which is uh, now about 3,000 pieces. It includes the finished lithographs and other prints, uh, mylars, uh, studies, uh, trial proofs, um, color separations where we can see where you can see the different plates and the different colors that were made. And uh, that collection will be uh, shown at the CU Art Museum. It was planned to have an exhibition in 2021, but due to the coronavirus, et cetera, uh, that has been postponed until uh, 2022. We're looking forward to having that uh, a show selected from the Shark Eye collection. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, both Enrique and Bud. It was really fascinating to um, hear about your process and your thoughts behind your work. So um, I uh, wanted to ask both of you a few questions. We have some questions from the audience as well. Um, but um, going back to um, your collaboration, uh, you've been working together for 22 years now and um, made 26 prints, which right. is quite an amazing um, time to work together. Um, and yeah. I'd like to hear more about what inspired you to approach Chagoya Bud um, to work with you in your studio. Um, well, I, I become aware of it, Enrique's prints through a, a, another artist friend in San Francisco, Don Ed Hardy. And Don's the one who uh, connected me with, with Enrique. And I like um, projects and artists that are a little bit unusual, that aren't sort of the, the and uh, and are often challenging. I like challenges. And uh, and when Enrique told me, oh, you can't print on the Amate paper, I immediately figured out how we could do that and uh, want to do that. And I was attracted to the imagery. I was attracted to him as a person and the way he makes his work. And that's the reason that I invited him to come to, to work with me. Also, right. I, I thought, I thought it would be, I thought it would be impossible to to print an amate because the amate is handmade. It has very thick and thin areas, uh, and it's on a bark paper. And when you print on it, it expands like a like a half an inch on a on a large sheet. And 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 I thought it would be impossible to print, but but find a way to flatten the paper by just uh, ca calendaring the paper like six times or so on through the press and before you start even printing on it. It's a lot of work. Yes. Right. So, um, a real testament to uh, the collaborative process and how a master printer can facilitate the vision of, of an artist. Um, we have also a question for you, Bud, from the audience. Um, can you talk more about how the university became interested in your archive? Well, uh, actually, we were we were interested in CU having an archive. Okay. They became interested in it. I mean, we felt like well, we we started actually collecting uh, the work and put and realizing that we wanted to have an archive of our work, and it seemed that we made a lot of sense to have it here in Colorado, where where all the work was done. Yes. Um, and uh, the uh, the director of the, the museum got very excited when we when I told them that we had this archive and that we were interested in having the, the museum acquire it. And uh, she got well behind it and supportive and 
started uh, raising funds, et cetera. And then, and they built a new art museum. So it was an excellent place for them to uh, host all the materials. Uh, she left and uh, a new curator, Sandra Furman arrived and she has taken up the, the Sharkhive and uh, most of the work has been transferred to the CU Art Museum. And we will continue to give uh, prints and related materials to the CU Art Museum and the Sharkhive for as long as we're, uh, as long as I continue to make prints. So it's an ongoing collection. Right. Enrique, I'd like to make uh, one question to you. Um, at Shark Sink and elsewhere, you've made this body of work that you call reverse anthropology. Um, and this is um, the idea behind them being that they're artifacts from a parallel universe in which the uh, Mesoamericans conquered the conquistadors and the cultural tables are turned and the indigenous culture is the dominant culture. Um, and I wondered if you could talk more about your use, and this was a question in the audience as well, of these conflicting um, symbols from various cultures, from the two sides of culture, um, and how it's your intention that um, this is a somewhat overwhelming experience and it's not necessarily meant to be a completely understood um, dialogue or narrative. Yes, no, I'll be happy. Uh, it, you know, originally, I mean, other people have thought about uh, reverse anthropology, especially the board, borders, border arts workshop in Tijuana, uh, the border between Tijuana and, and San Diego. Um, back in the in the late 80s, early 90s, but in my case, I decided that the 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 point would be not so much how the world would be if, let's say, Native Americans had conquered Europe, because at the end it would have been just a different scenario, but it, with equally terrible results. You know, the, the, instead of uh, cathedrals in Europe, they might have pyramids and so on. Uh, not a, not necessarily a better outcome, but I decided that. Uh, more to challenge the perspective of, of the, the victors of war by presenting the perspective of those who quote unquote lost the wars because uh, that perspective is lost in history. And I decided to use the language of uh, the pre-Columbian books, which is more a pictorial language that uh, is more meant for performing. In other words, it reminds you of, of religious elements, calendaric elements, uh, mythological stories, without words. It's language without words. So I began to use that, that, that kind of a non-linear narrative that could be interpreted in different ways, but from the indigenous uh, perspective of the language the indigenous cultures use in their books. Uh, like for instance, the, 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 the book I did on the portentosa life of death, uh, I, I said the, the whole title was the, the one I show with uh, Xerox uh, lithographic uh, transfers. Uh, by the way, I forgot to mention that was published by Catherine, uh, the master printer was uh, Catherine Kane. Uh, uh, so we, um, we used that language uh, and, and that image was used also in another book I did with Bud Shark, The Escape from Fantasylandia, but it was more simplified in the, the, the monoprints. So that a kind of non-phonetic language is what that dictates uh, most of my books. And, and sometimes people get a little confused because they don't know what to read. And, but that's just because some of the symbology is lost in history. A lot of the symbology is per Columbian and uh, you know, uh, anthropologists are working really hard to decipher, especially the Mayan writing, which is thankfully one of the, the ones that survived the most, but still, I tried to do a contemporary twist. Originally, I was focusing on the U.S.-Mexican uh, clash of cultures, but after I lived for a period in Europe, uh, a couple of times in France, I, I decided that the, the problem is more global. Everything's globalized. And I still use the pre-Columbian idea of visual languages with, 
with uh, pictograms talking to each other, creating a multiple narrative, even though I open the context to more of contemporary times. So I hope I answered the question. And hopefully with some sense yes. of humor too. Yes, yes. Get... there's a question about humor. You're anticipating <laughs> where I'm going next. Um, so yeah. you do, I know you prioritize humor in your work and it, it's always important to you. Uh, I think I remember you talked about how with Goya's, your pieces that are recreations of Goya's, you, you think a long time about how you want to take that original Goya image and how can you do something funny, you know, in, with contemporary work. So can you speak more from the audience that says, can you talk about incorporating humor with such heavy material? Uh, yes, for me, um... Uh, humor is a defense against very painful situations. And in Mexico, I grew up with that sense of humor. Uh, in general, the culture in Mexico finds a way to laugh about very de de deadly scenarios. And maybe it's perhaps I, I mentioned a little bit the idea behind the concept of life and death in pre-Columbian times. And it's not that Mexicans laugh at death. It's not about day of the death. It's more about uh, somehow a uh, humor that interacts with death that uh, somehow overcomes the, 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 the painful cir circumstances. And Robert Tone, when he uh, visited Mexico in, in the in, in 1940s, uh, he decided that Mexico was a surrealist country. <laughs> and he decided that Frida Kahlo was a surrealist artist, although Frida Kahlo didn't see herself as a surrealist. She saw herself as a realist artist. So, but that gives you an idea of the, the contrast of the Mexican vision of life and death. And this kind of a, a surrealist uh, imagery, which Andre Breton, in, in, in a way, defined uh, the, the surrealist humor as the triumph, the triumph of pleasure over the 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 most difficult circumstances, over pain, over the most difficult circumstances for pleasure, and before he say that, that's what it was doing. <laughs> I don't do it because Andre Breton wrote it. But I, for me, is the triumph of pleasure over pain under the worst circumstances for pleasure, and uh, I hope that answers the question. And and that opens the door to very complex issues and I hope uh, that way I, I'm not preaching anything. I'm trying not to convince anybody of what I think. And I, I, if, I, if anything, I'm expressing my own anxieties, but with a sense of humor, like what, will, what people in Mexico will do after an earthquake or after a major disaster, you could see all kinds of jokes that somehow I don't experience when I have an earthquake, uh, experience of an earthquake in the Bay Area. There was no jokes, you know, the, the big earthquake in the 80s. Well, in Mexico a few years before, which, you know, lost thousands of people uh, die, people were telling one joke after another. So, so it's just a cultural difference. But I grew up in that culture. My own family is very nasty at, you know, bullying each other in the middle of lunch or a comida. And if you if you get mad, you lose. You have to come back with a with a funnier funnier joke, and that goes from the little kids to the grandparents. You know? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to um, do one more question from the audience, and then we will move into a discussion about how we are all functioning in our current reality. So um, the question is about your teaching, which um, is an important part of what you do. Enrique, um, you are a professor at Stanford University um, for art practice, is that the actual title? Yes. Yes, yes. okay. <laughs> and uh, you teach, you've been teaching there for, for 20 odd years. years. Yeah, 25 years. Mm -hmm. So the question is, how do you impart a sense of responsibility and social integrity to your students in their own practice? Well, I try to inspire whatever the students had in mind. I, 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 I don't try to um, talk about my own artwork with them, I, unless they are curious and they want to know. But for the most part, like I teach drawing, printmaking, painting, and a graduate, uh, two graduate seminars, one on art, a criti critique of their work and another graduate seminar on art and economics. But um, the, uh, with my undergrad students, I first teach them techniques, but then I ask them to, to do some, something significant for them. Not for me, but for them. What will be significant in their lives? 
And I've been surprised with some amazing uh, students of mine that come up with very, you know, very powerful, sometimes very poetic imagery, um, is very self-affirming uh, imagination. And uh, for me, it's just a dialogue. I, I don't feel like I'm uh, teaching art per se. I'm just encouraging art, but I, I don't think art cannot be teach art per se. I don't think anybody could really teach art, but you, you might inspire people to make art because there is no recipes for creativity. I wish there were recipes for creativity. Well, I'll just follow them <laughs> or anybody follow them, but uh, it's, uh, it's part of the human complex uh, mind uh, when you invent and create something uh, that didn't exist before. But my students, for the most part, I hope they find inspiration with uh, or group critiques and well, with an ongoing dynamic in the group. And my best reward is when they're happy with the class and they discover something in themselves that they didn't know they had. That's to me the goal of, of teaching. And I learn from them because as they say, whoever teaches learns twice. So I learn from my students a lot. Yes. And Bud, you've been a teacher in the past as well. And you have a lot of personal assistants who've moved on to very important roles at various organizations, print shops. Yes. Can you speak a little bit about your role in shepherding a new generation into the, 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 your profession? Um, well, yeah, I, I work, I've worked a lot with a lot of artists in long times, like with Enrique, but I also like connecting with new younger artists that I haven't worked with before. And those are uh, exciting and interesting projects for me. And it, it mixes the, it makes the mix a little more interesting, but I have a lot of artists that I've worked with regularly, like Enrique who come, well, Enrique comes every year, some artists come every other year and those relationships are extremely important to me and um, the, we develop a body of work that's really interesting to see how the how the artist's work changes and uh, uh, artists who are in the studio and see what another artist did and say well i want to do something like that or i want to use that process or something it it, it makes it all uh, very interesting and sometimes very challenging, but I, I like that part of it also. Great, thank you. Well, Judy, um, could you come back and uh, join us to talk about the future and our current reality? Okay, I think I'm back. Um, we wanted to take a couple of minutes for those of you who can stick around um, just to talk about how we're all adapting professionally uh, during the pandemic. Um, I know that Bud was supposed to participate in the IFPDA print fair at the end of October at the Javits Center. The Javits Center had, was turned into a hospital. That was canceled, which is a major um, hit to the print world. However, IFP, IFPDA mobilized, and this week is opening up um, an online print fair this week that will last a month, and it's live through Artsy and Bud has a full um, viewing room along with all of the members and including members who couldn't um, physically exhibit um, in the fair in past years. So, so that's a kind of positive. Um, Enrique, we can talk about um, the very moving uh, writing uh, that you did for the Shelter in Place Chronicles um, for squarecylinder.com. Uh, I know Manhattan Graphic Center is greatly accelerating their online programs. And at IPCNY, we're doing the same thing um, in many realms. And I wanted to just take two minutes to show you um, through Jen Bradovich, IPCNY's exhibition and curatorial manager. If she can join us, she'll show you uh, the website that uh, she created from scratch uh, as our spring show, including Enrique's work was uh, canceled due to the closing of the gallery. Jen. Hi everybody, thanks Judy. Um, 
I, when, when COVID forced us to close our gallery, it was right before the works for our show reprint five projects um, were meant to arrive in the space. So we had to, to quickly figure out a way to bring um, the show to you digitally online. And what we really wanted to do was create something that wasn't super static, but would be dynamic and give people an opportunity to see works um, up close and to spend time uh, navigating intuitively and um, experiencing more information along the way um, as they wanted. Um, so I'm just going to very quickly show you um, what the website looks like and um, demo its features using um, Enrique's page, which features uh, one of the um, one of the codices um, that he's printed with Bud. So this is Return of the Macrobiotic Hannibal from 1998. And like the other codices we've looked at tonight, it's also on Amate and it's read from the right over here to the left. I'm gonna show you details further down. And on each page for the site, um, which is organized by artists, you'll see these texts about the work. And then you'll also see these opportunities to hear these um, really nice audio clips from Jennifer Farrell, who's associate curator in um, drawings and prints at the Met. Um, in case you want more information, they really add uh, another level of engagement. So this uh, codex introduces um, Enrique's character of the utopian cannibal, who you kind of see here on the right, wearing a head from the famous Mesoamerican um, Borgia Codex. And he sort of romps through this landscape uh, that Sarah described um, as sort of belonging to this clash of of signifiers ranging from a, a myriad of sources. Um, on our website, we only offer a, a small uh, selection of the, the multiple different um, sources that Enrique is working from. But when you get to the bottom of the pages, you'll see an opportunity to go deeply into those as well. Um, any of the um, little read more buttons here. We'll pull up more information if you're interested in learning more, more information about those source materials. Um, you might see things you recognize such as Superman who here is being punched by Spider-Man but in Enrique's book is knocked out by an Aztec skull. Um, you may also notice uh, imagery from this book, Border uh, Jim Star of the Border Patrol, which is a, a 1937 children's book about a sort of gunslinging um, border patrol officer at the Mexican border. And you may see images from um, European sources uh, of the 17th century, uh, images of, of uh, the so-called new world that Europeans were kind of dreaming up. And so here you see Spanish ships arriving on, on the so-called uh, cannibal island. And these are all sources that Enrique uses critically in this reverse modernism approach. So at the bottom of each page, you see an option to, to get in touch with us. We really want you to be able to have a dialogue um, like you would in the gallery with us. And so you have an opportunity to join the conversation, to share questions, share your experiences of the site, share the connections that you make. They come directly to me. We'll share the, the insights, the questions we're getting. We'll keep the dialogue going in a, in a two-directional way with you. So please do reach out and do get in touch with us as we're, uh, as we're experiencing this show from a distance. That's great. Wonderful. Thank you. Maybe, Bud, you could just tell us a little bit about what you know about online. Oops. Am I muted? No. Um, of the online IFPDA print fair, which is the first time they've done uh, any such thing. I'd love to hear that. And then I'd love to hear, Bud, um, Enrique, from you about the uh, Shelter in Place Chronicles and the very moving language um, and images that you show. Um, so, Yeah, uh, so I was invited by uh, David Roth, who, who is the editor of uh, Square Cylinder, to answer a few questions about uh, artists. He, he, he did three, three, episode, uh, three uh, publications already about artists living under uh, you know, COVID-19. And what I wrote, I, I didn't think I was going to say so much, but I ended up writing more than what he asked me. I, I feel what I feel that these times, it's kind of like, like the uh, the first time I feel that outside or or door, there is death waiting for us. 
but in the middle of the most beautiful, most uh, uh, nice clean air that we have, at least at, uh, here in the Bay Area, we, we have a, a beautiful landscape and the birds are everywhere. The flowers are flowering in the middle of the spring. We have hummingbirds that go back and forth in our house. We take walks to a nearby mountain and yet we feel this existential threat and like most people you know we never lived through a pandemic we didn't know what a pandemic was until it's really happening and for me this is kind of like a message we're getting from 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 nature it's a message maybe sent by a bat to tell us with maybe it's, a, it's as i say it's, it's, it's a tough love kind of a message from nature to tell us that we better be in tune with nature. We, we cannot be separated from nature. We, we have to find ways in which we deal with the animal world, with the ecology, with the climate in, in a more uh, sustainable way. Otherwise, we're going to extinct ourselves. Nature is wise enough to design something that is attacking us only who, as who we are. We are social beings. And we cannot be social beings right now, except uh, by digital uh, ways. So it's attacking exactly who we are. It's been attacking other animals, but other animals seem to survive, like cats and dogs. They, they are fine with it. But people, I mean, it's just uh, a message for me. So, so my 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 point, and if you read the article in in, in uh, the Squares Healing there, because it's all, also the artists. My wife Cara Maria uh, talks about it. Luis de Soto, a Native American uh, artist, also talks about it. Um, Lulu Stanley, who is, uh, was one of my teachers. Uh, it, all, of, all these artists have different concerns of, of, about COVID-19, but all of, all of us kind of share an existential uh, uh, view of what to do with this world. It goes beyond any art we could make. The economy, on the other hand, is in a very imbalance. Uh, we see Wall Street going up since uh, the government began to buy corporate bonds. Wall Street seems so happy with the bailout. In the meantime, we see the longest lines in the food banks that we, we remember ever seeing since maybe the, the big depression. So this virus is coming, bringing out uh, or, 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 or social inequities. Uh, you know, like more people of color, like brown and, and black uh, people seem to be more affected by this virus. And, but in very general terms, we really need to reset our interaction with, with, within ourselves as well as ourselves with nature, the world, as we know. Otherwise, I, I, I don't know if, if, if this uh, message is not being taken into account. I don't know what else can do that. Otherwise, we, we're going to get more pandemics. We're going to get more climate extremes, and we will have maybe not even a choice to react to it or to, to, or to respond to it. That's, I think, a, a concern that many of my fellow artists uh, have, and maybe all, many of you have in the audience and, and yourself. But I saw reproductions of 2020 paintings that looked very current in the references to politics. Are any of those, um, were any of those made recently while you've yeah. been at home? Tell us about working at home versus working in the studio. Yeah, uh, well, uh, I don't have access to my studio because it's at the university. So, uh, so I've been working on the, on the, on the dining room on a hand-painted codex. So I'm working on a small scale, but um, so I have to rethink about everything. Uh, my, my, I, I was gonna have a, an exhibition at uh, my local gallery, uh, Anglin Gilbert Gallery, and now it's postponed permanently. Um, and many galleries might not even reopen. The, this situation, this economic situation is also very tough on artists in general. So, uh, so I've been I've been dealing on a small scale format, and uh, and yes, I'm I'm painting mostly things about what is happening today. The, the paintings you saw in uh, Square Ceiling are from this year, and they're still in progress. I haven't finished them. I didn't have time to show paintings because also this is about printmaking, not about paintings. So I didn't show any 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 paintings that didn't relate to my prints, but. 
Uh, but yeah, I, I, I've been uh, uh, dealing with this issue and I guess people should, should check uh, uh, the square cylinder for more imagery. So, so it's, uh, it's artists respond, responding to COVID-19. And I am on the second, on the second part. And so, thank you, Enrique. Bud, can you tell us how the IFPDA online artsy art fair came about um, and how you've participated and what you have on display? Bud, you're, you need to unmute yourself. I think we lost Sarah. Sarah's computer crashed, but she's rebooting. Okay. okay, but you're with us. Great. Yeah, well, I'm. I'm quite impressed with how the how the IFPDA has has uh, uh, dealt uh, dealt with the uh, COVID, and uh, I think their online exhibition is very good. Um, I think everybody's trying their best, and I think. It, it, we're we're seeing some response to the to that uh, online, um, and uh, yeah, but I, I, I it's understandable that they won't be able to do the fair this fall, and uh, it's uh, so when we're all trying to figure out new ways of getting our work out there and connecting with with. Uh, people who want, who are interested in the work, and uh, I think we all have to try new things. And Bud, what do you have access to your workshop? Can you continue some level of work in there without your full staff? Well, we we actually started work last at the beginning of this week, and uh, I have my two assistants, and we're we're actually in production again. Great. The studio, the studio is where we live, so it's easy for me. And I was in and out of the studio for six or eight weeks uh, trying to do things, but uh, we're now able to to print again. And uh, I have another project coming up later this month, an artist from New Mexico. So we're getting back in the swing of things. Yeah. Wonderful. There are many more questions, but we're nearing an hour and a half point. We could go on for a long time, but uh, there are a lot of comments that we'll share with both Enrique and Bud, and there are questions that we'll answer um, online before we completely end um, this broadcast session. Unfortunately, Sarah's computer crashed, and she's been trying to reboot, and she was going to do the thank you and, and the sign off. So I'm gonna do it on her behalf and uh, thank the teams at um, Manhattan Graphic Center and IPCNY for pulling this together very quickly. This is both of our firsts um, in terms of live webinars, but not our last. So um, we're gonna zap you a, a two minute survey and we would really like to hear uh, your comments on, on, on duration, on time of day, on what you wanna hear so we can design programming that you wanna see. And I wanna thank particularly Enrique for giving us his time, for giving us his creativity, and to Bud for, for being there and for Barbara helping out behind the scenes and um, sharing your stories uh, in a way that uh, we might not have been able to uh, in person in New York with both of you um, in other time zones. And uh, I think with that, we'll leave it. And uh, thank you, we thank you, Judy. And, thank you and all so much. And, and, and don't and forget I, to visit I, uh, ManhattanGraphicsCenter.org uh, and IPCNY.org for future programming. And thank you, Sarah. Thank I hope you. she's listening. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, everyone. All right. Bye bye, bud. Bye, bye, Enrique. So long. I see you later. <laughs>